Alosha is a Russian-based eco-architectural visionary who is combining the ideas of the world's most radical thinkers into one design. He's traveled the world studying with a who's who list of architects, natural builders, and permaculturalists. His innovative organic designs are inspired by the work of Gaudi and look like something out of Jacques Fresco's Venus Project. He created an educational platform called the BioVeda Academy and has taught over 1,600 students both online and at his hands-on workshops. I first discovered Alosha many years ago when I stumbled upon his YouTube channel, and even for me, someone who is obsessed with this stuff, discovering Alosha was a shock. Not because I thought he was crazy, but because I related with him. It felt like I had stumbled into an alternate version of myself from the future. A version of myself that dared to actually create designs right out of my wildest dreams. That's why I'm very excited to announce that I'm finally going to be meeting with Alosha live on air. Together we are going to sit down and discuss these wild designs and geek out over all things eco-housing. So I don't know what to tell you. If that didn't get you excited for this, then I don't know what will. Without further ado, I'm sitting here with Alosha from BioVeda Academy out of Russia. This guy is someone who I've been waiting to talk to uh, for years and we're finally sitting down and we're going to get a chance to geek out and be uh, eco housing nerds together. So I'm very excited to spend some time talking with you, Alosha. So Eric, actually, I found you through copious amounts of plowing in through YouTube, like, you know, us researchers, it's obviously winter in Russia, so there's not much building that can be done. Some drowning in YouTube videos on anything I can find on uh, solar passive uh, greenhouses and, of course, solar passive homes. So I'm very much inspired by the Earthships, like uh, to the point that I went and built with Mike Reynolds in Africa, in Malawi, on one of the projects to build a school there. And I went to Taos for a little seminar there. They had a, a, a four-day seminar. And I've taken his online academy, so it's kind of been in bits and bobs. Um, so I found, uh, Eric, I found your channel and I just was impressed by the level of detail because uh, I think I irritated the Earthship crew because I kept on sending there, but where's the detail of you guys doing the tin, tin work on the, on the wood? You know, that, that's important detail. Oh, no, no, that, 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 you, that you've got to come here for. Then, uh, oh, but uh, your lesson on how to draw the home on the ground is very short. It's like it's three minutes. The lesson how to draw the home on the ground is three minutes. I'm like, but I, I don't understand. You tell me start was this time. So in short, Eric, I was impressed by the level of details because I would say after watching the few videos that you've just posted from November to, you know, just your recent, uh, you know, completion of the build, I am just from your videos able to build the structure. And I wasn't able to do that after watching a $1,100 Earthship Academy. So the one time I'm sad that you're not making any money out of this, <laughs> but on the other time I'm happy because you're giving all this information for free. And I told it to my wife tonight and she's like, please, such a good man, just uh, wish him good health and abundance for the rest of his life and to his family. And because to share information, I think it is so beautiful. Um, and that's the day and age we're in. And whilst I, I know I've got a paid course, we also have a YouTube channel where we share a lot. So, yeah, that's that's. Uh, and then, uh, just a quick intro myself. Just love bioarchitecture. I think I'm as obsessed about bioarchitecture. I can't comment on you because I don't know that well, but definitely Mike Reynolds. I'm thinking I'm on that level of obsession. I dream, sleep, and eat. Uh, uh, like eco home that can heat itself without three months of sun and be fully self-sufficient in Siberian and Canadian temperature, but with no sun uh, for the long duration of time without using firewood. If I can just pinpoint it like that, that that's me, been my obsession. So we'll, we'll unpack that whole concept during the, uh, uh, the this conversation, but. That's that. That's where I'm going. Love curvilinear design, so have a very big problem with linear squares and anything rectangular. <laughs> I love curves. This is actually one of my own creations behind me. Uh, I've been designing curves. So I'd say in three words, I'm trying to merge sacred geometry, Gaudi, Mike Reynolds, Earthship, and a Chinese passive greenhouse. It was a Canadian passive greenhouse, all into one 
uh, play space. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is why I love you. I really feel like you're, and I don't know if you saw the intro that I gave you in my other update video, but you're basically like a version of myself, but we just kind of, you know, manifested on other sides of the world right now. Now, so it's nice to get to uh, have a play date with you and talk about all this stuff because honestly, what you're offering is something that people have always asked me consistently for years when I present ideas about passive solar homes is does this work in an Arctic climate? That is the number one question that everyone has is does this work in the Arctic climate? So this is actually a really interesting conversation and in a way what you're providing and what you're going to be testing when you build this, uh, yeah, prototype of yours uh, in the Siberian landscape, or I don't know necessarily if you, do you have permafrost where you are, where you're located in Russia? Eric, um, our ground freezes, all, all the pipes by, not law, but by recommendation, uh, by law we can do anything we want, but <laughs> by recommendation we should dig our pipes at least four, well, four to five feet deep. That's how deep the ground freezes in winter. Um, you know, and it takes quite some time to thaw out all the way until basically end of April, it slowly defrosts. But in terms of permanent permafrost, no, it's not here. Yeah. yeah, so that's the thing, right? Is everyone always asks this question, oh, well, does it really work in these climates where we don't get sun for such a long period of time? And later, when we dig deeper into your drawings, that's you know mostly what I would like to focus on is how you are combating the lack of sunlight during the winter to make a new type of eco shelter that actually creates its own heat uh, without burning, like you said, wood or uh, okay. other. Uh, yeah. So Eric, uh, after plowing all of the YouTube videos and um, and even the Russian videos of what Russian people are doing in, in the cold climate, I've realized that the main, that what I'm trying to build, and I'm not trying to get my head up, just from pure service and sharing with the people, what I'm trying to build has not been attempted to before. In a way that, uh, first of all, if we look at the Canadian greenhouse, okay, they would stick some pipes in the ground and what they say is we're banking for three to four days of no sun because there's loads of sun there. Um, sure, the temperatures are as cold as here and even colder, but it could be one day sun, no sun, two days, no sun, and then bang, it comes out. It's uh, already, it's about 14 degrees, you know, off the horizon and it's bright. So with some proper glazing of polycarbonate, you suddenly bump up your temperature right up. So the, the difference with me is that from November to February, we are overcast. I'm not even speaking that the, the sun comes up at 10 o'clock in the morning and sets at three o'clock in, in the evening because we're so far north. The time that it is there, it's overcast. So when it's not overcast, when it gets to about minus 15 Fahrenheit, that's so crisp and cold and dry, that it burns all the clouds out, if I can just uh, you know put it uh, straight. So then the sun comes out and it's like, oh my God, it's so cold. Like, uh, I have to stick a heater in my car for nine hours before I can start, you know, that kind of thing. So let's look at the, let's look at the greenhouse. Uh, so let's look at the solar passive house in Canada. So now we spoke about the greenhouse, we spoke about solar passive house in Canada. It's a freaking envelope of, one and a half foot thick of insulation, two foot thick insulation on the wall, two foot thick insulation on the roof, okay? Very fancy technologies such as those uh, heat exchanges that take in the fresh cold air and they mm -hmm. uh, warm it up by stale warm air leaving the house and then they get that house too. I looked at the cost, Eric, and I fell off the a chair. It's, uh, we're running at three to five hundred dollars <laughs> a square foot. So whilst yeah. they claim that it's like bigger, there's some sizes that say it's better than an airship, and sure, but they're not look. They, there's no thermal mass. Like Mike Reynolds drew that little house sticking out of the ground, and he says, "Like what the hell is this? The home should be blended in because the ground has a certain warmth of temperature. You know what I mean? It's, it needs to be blended into the environment. So that typical home that Mike Reynolds draws was a was a pitch roof." 
that's Canadian solar passive design. This was a real, imagine that combined with a polystyrene cooler box for beer. So that's what they achieved, okay? At a cost of $400 a square foot. So that idea is out because the main principle that I'm trying to achieve is that how can a DIY person uh, that's got like a, a little bit of hands-on skills, nothing major, but build this home without climbing into debt? So I'm trying to resolve a few issues and I'll speak of how I want to get a person dry, fast, on the land and under the roof without paying mortgage anymore and without paying rent and stopping transportation costs back and forth to the land whilst they're constructing. So that's why the whole design is actually fractal, which I'll speak later. So you build a one room with a little greenhouse, similar to Earthship survival model. You build just one room, tiny and uh, even smaller. And then you grow outwards from there in the following season. But in the first season, you just build one room with a geodesic. That's why the geodesic is a very much big part of it. Um, another inspiration I've taken is the Chinese greenhouse. And, and maybe I should show some slides if you don't mind. Absolutely, yeah. And for those of you who don't know, while Alosha is getting his slides up, he's been doing a drawing class. We just sat down for the first few lessons here this weekend, and I've been in uh, very much enjoying it. We've been spending some time looking at Alosha's designs and learning basically the way that he thinks and how he draws his design. So actually behind me here, I have one of his flagship models, the Wadalarium, which we're going to be talking about uh, briefly. And so some of these designs that he's about to show I've seen already, and uh, we can dive really deep into this subject matter now because not only did Alosha and I want to jump on air, but we're, we are prepared, my friends. We are prepared. We've been sending links back and forth and designs and pictures and images. So we're about to drop some major knowledge on you. So without further ado, let's see this Chinese greenhouse that inspired your design, Alosha. So unfortunately, I, I, I might need to just send you a link for the video of them walking into this thing through a 15 meter uh, side wall. So if you look at the Earthship uh, picture on the right, okay, here at the bottom, if you could picture that this mm -hmm. entrance is on the east or, or, or on the west side of the Earthship, and uh, I'll send you a video and you will have your jaw or what, wide open, but you're walking through a 15 foot side of the, green, of the greenhouse. What you're seeing on the top left is the back of the greenhouse. It's about the same size. The berm is about the same size as the Ursha berm, but it's just mass. It's just mass. So the, now you're starting to understand how different this is to a, a, a typical um, uh, Canadian solar passive greenhouse because they just have a few pipes under the ground and they gather the, 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 the hot air from the top and they channel it underground. So this is what I want to do. Um, um, I want to combine the uh, all of these methodologies, and maybe I should maybe speak of how we got there first, Eric. So I'm gonna. So I, I think I'm just gonna fly through my uh, presentation quickly, so we can at least get it done with. So just to, just to finish the story. So basically, I've been plowing through all this uh, knowledge, and uh, I've realized that what the Earthship models got is um, was a thick thermal mass and an insulation showered in the mass is a very, very, very thoughtful concept. Where in my particular climate, the Earthship comes short is in a couple of reasons. My ground is much colder than Taos. That's the first challenge. So I'm still in two minds whether I need to insulate under my home or not. But I be, I'm tending towards the idea of actually insulating under because my ground is six degrees. So when I'm talking about insulation underground, I don't mean sticking some polystyrene or something like that. I want something cheaper, possibly perlite or pumice, some volcanic rock that I can just get a truckload of this rock. It's very lightweight and porous, and I'm going to put a, 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 a layer down pretty deep, probably about five feet down, provided that my water table is low, and it is low. If your water table is high, you do not want to do this. And the best way to see it is in spring um, when the uh, snow uh, melts and then you really see how high your water table. So, um, so that's the first challenge. The second challenge is, as I said, the sun. Taos 
uh, whilst they're showing you some winter pictures with snow uh, on earth ships, they have sun all the time. It's the desert. So um, that's that, that's the, another challenge that uh, I have to, I have to bang for three months of heat where a Canadian greenhouse has to bang for three days of heat. Okay, um, Canadian passive solar home, we spoke uh, separately, you have to climb into such a big debt hole, it's not even possible. The other thing I'm trying to solve is a problem with uh, deforestation. So we are the stewards of the earth and we need to show alternative ways of how to heat our homes without firewood. And the research, by the way, I've done, you can get the same quantity of energy of heat from firewood, whether you compost it in Jean Payne's hot composting method, the French guy. That's another uh, master wizard that I've incorporated. So if you don't know about him, research him, amazing, uh, uh, amazing stuff. He basically got heat for six months of the year. So I'm incorporating his design in a reactor that I'll be showing you um, in some of the previous designs and I'm doing it in this latest design right now. So, and I have to insulate my foundation straight down um, four feet. Four feet down, I need to have a skirt or something that stops the heat from going uh, sideways and from underneath. And then after I put the perlite, I will be putting uh, the pipes. I'll have some pipes that can heat up my, 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 my wetlands because it's proven that the, war the warmer the the warmer the plant medium, the soil for the plants, the better the germination rate. I want to create a jungle because this other challenge we have is I'm six months locked <laughs> indoors. I'm locked indoors for six months of the year because of the cold. And sure, some people say, why don't you move? I don't want to move. We have so much freedom in Russia. Um, freedom is really weighing up for me all the odds of moving anywhere. Nobody touches me. I don't close my doors. Uh, I don't have to report any building. I don't have any building regulations. I can build a three-story airship. Not that I would, because it just goes beyond, uh, the, you know. But I can build a three-story house tomorrow and not report it to anybody and still be able to sell it without reporting it to anybody. <laughs> so we, we, we don't have to do anything. We have so much water. We, we dig two me three meters deep, nine feet deep, and we have more water that we can handle. We can never pump enough because of all the snow melt. I mean, usually I'm quite against pumping from underground. So that means that the big water tanks that the Earthship have, I don't have to have it. Sure, I'll still have a little water tank as a backup, maybe a, a, a 500 gallons at most, a, a thousand gallons at most, maybe not even. But no, I'm tapping straight from the ground with a pump. So my water organizing module is gonna be slightly different. Instead of the 12 volt little, uh, Flow, uh, for flow jet or what they call those Mexican pumps, the little black ones, I'd have that straight to the well pump. Uh, just it's much stronger and, and, and so on. So these are some of the differences that I'll need to have. And of course the reactor, I need to bang for three months of sun. So the reactor that I'll be sharing with you now uh, and just uh, you'll understand what, what's, uh, what's going on. And it's taken me some time to get there. Um, so let me know when you got the slide up. It's starting now. So we just got to the first slide uh, and now it went black again. Hold, hold on. The evolution. Yeah, the evolution of Wadalarium biotexture. There we go. Yeah, just this is the it's good couple stuff. Of, yeah, yeah. It's a couple of uh, it's a couple, couple of designs here, but we're gonna go into each one of those separately. So I'm just gonna fly through so we can keep it dynamic. Um I've got a less I've got a lesson on this in depth. So obviously uh, the dream is to live in community. So here's 120 hectare piece of land, 250 acres for 70 families. Here are the families on the, on the left, uh, the little pieces, uh, one acre each, uh, their communal uh, place, uh, communal uh, garden, vegetable gardens, they all have their, their individual gardens with little uh, um, fences with made of trees. Uh, a conference center, sacred geometry, food forest garden. And this is all made to a specific piece of land. All the roads are on contour. This is a hill here that we have a hobbit, little hobbit homes where all the master craftsmen are working. So this is very much a tourist model with two schools. There is an Earthship Hotel on contour. You can see on top in the middle, an Earthship Hotel here. Um, here's our, perma here's our um, eco building school right here with open pieces of lawns. Uh, where we can build up little, you know, what my does every time they build something, it goes up, you know, so you need to allocate for that. 
So, yeah, it, it's a dream, a market right in the middle of the beginning of the land, which can sell all the produce. It's very much a tourist uh, attraction uh, that works on the weekends, for example. That's one, that's one of the main ways that people make money. There is a festival ground here for the adults. There's a little festival ground for the kids. Um, theater, labyrinth, lots of cooperatives. There's a whole bunch of domes for rental around the pond uh, um, and so on. So I'm not going to go into it, but that's basically the dream to so just put myself into a context of what I'd love to build one day. I'm not saying I'm going to go as crazy as this, but uh, here's a permaculture uh, center right here um, with aquaculture and all the vegetable beds, uh, all the little flowers that we're propagating. So that's the vision. That's the dream. But it all starts with uh, something. It starts with a building. You know, you've got to have, uh, you know, you want to be able to, you know, yeah, you want to have a house over your roof and hopefully death free. So here's some of the sketches that I was doing back in, uh, 2010, 2011, um, and I'll show you the one on the left. You just take note of these two drawings. That's the top view of this little dome here with wetland. So this is, um, so I'm, at this point, I'm starting to read Ursha books. I'm starting to see uh, the, the, uh, how the wetlands are working, the botanical cells. I'm starting to check the books from Carl Earth, um, and that's why the sandbags are starting to appear. Here's a little tunnel. Uh, here's a to top of the dome with the tunnel. So using colored bags, I want to put the, because we're in Africa, so I'm putting the earthship wetlands on the outside and some inside with them creeping over. Yeah, so uh, a little gun here you're seeing is actually William Reich's uh, organ, organ cloud buster that changes the weather. So that's just the thinking. And then I moved onto a land and, you know, started building, went to a colors workshop, went to Taos, learned from Mike Reynolds and, Here's a donkey boiler that heats up for five showers. I started building this permaculture school. Um, then I went to a ferro cement workshop and uh, attended Mike Reynolds uh, when he came to Malawi. That's that's the three pictures on the left. That's uh, in Malawi. I was building that school, the flower, his flower design. I took responsibility for this little pod because I, I had I have knowledge of ferro cement. So you know I was like really took one of those pods onto myself. Uh, pictures from Carl Earth here, top right. And then I came back after the ferrous mint workshop and I built myself a, 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 a 33 foot by 18 foot ferrous cement roof, which was obviously as a second project. My first project was a dome, a, a little booth for the dogs. You know, and when I saw that work, you, you scale up. So ferrous cement and, and the arches, there's a thing called strength through geometry. If, you're, if I were to make this roof flat, I would have to go five times thick and probably use 10 times more steel. But because I use the curves, I was able to get to three inches, four inches thick at most, and uh, it's a clear span roof. So I love the idea of creating shells. Um, then back in 2011, that's us on the farm creating this airship, and you can see my wetlands actually worked out. So, so that was really great. You know, we started to sculpt the guts outside so it can catch water and sink a geodesic sphere underground, very much driven by fear at the time of 2012 coming to our doorstep. So making a dream catcher into a sphere here so my family could sit if the earth start to move, you know, there it is complete. So the earthship wetlands you can see. So those are the pencil drawings I showed you on the front and in the beginning, that's basically us making that. Uh, and these little half moon shapes are for the trees. So I had five wetlands and, and four trees. And the fifth one was this oven on the top right that you see. Obviously didn't get my size right, so the sphere sticking out. So I had to get an excavator. Um, digging this with manpower of clay was a joke. And then I'm starting to put some of my own earthship designs, very much, very similar to earthships at the time, but uh, using Cal Earth as domes. And so this was just before I went to Mike Reynolds and Towers. So I wanted to do some sketches. So, you know, combining the geodesic domes, again, same story. There's a Russian bed here with a Russian oven and a bed that warms up like a rocket stove mass heater with a couch. So you can see the curves. These are wetlands. In the, so that's – and then, then, we, then we moved away from the land for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of them was a robbery in South Africa by one of my laborers. So we, we went back to Johannesburg, the most dangerous city on earth, where I had a home that I was paying mortgage for that I bought in 2007 and uh, I, I learned to love my house again and I built a dome here and some of the designs. So we built a wetland, once again, Earthship wetland here, very much uh, exactly to Earthship specs. So there it is, the drawing on the right. And then <clears throat> went did a couple of designs in, in Malawi and, 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 sorry, in Ghana and Nepal using same double dome, one uh, sandbag, one air crete. And then 
uh, yeah, I started to use sacred geometry, very much still working with domes and warm climate, but that's a one to 1.618 proportions, left to right to front to back and uh, making little domes. Again, wetlands incorporated obviously everywhere. Fell in love with Earthship wetlands. Designing a center, getting inspiration from using multiple vaults that can be repetitive in the center and doing some design. I'm just gonna fly through this because it's just what, what got me there. Some alternative designs for warmer climates, again, <laughs> using Earthship, Earthship greenhouses uh, in a different way, uh, attached to a vault on the side with three, um, three large windows into the vault. So still using my Reynolds methodology, just, just, just showing you, applying my own design. And I'll show you this water tank I've built in South Africa. So all these features are built. Um, again, now developing, combining an Earthship into something I call the T7. There's a wetland on the on the front once again with a giant uh, greenhouse uh, and Cal Earth half pods attached to the back. And at the time I was running my deco business, so uh, the, the geodesic I already started testing. Sure, it's PVC and metal, but I already started testing the features that that, that would work. How would that look like? You know, obviously I, I wanted to use this this uh, PVC dome attached to a home, but. Um, uh, yeah, we just decided to leave. Uh, I decided to leave Russia, or I mean South Africa altogether. So then, <clears throat> I'm gonna get back to this drawing. But basically, yeah, let me get back to this drawing because this is pretty much already the next level of where I'm going. But I'll still want to show you the evolution. So then, clay models are really great because they teach you a lot. Like if you see from the top here, you know, whilst I've got a really nice design on you know, doing sandbags all the way to the top. And uh, by the way, I, present, I wanted to present this for Mars. Um, the reality in the clay model showed me that all of the sandbags started to fall in because, you know, they're, they're not meant to be lying like as beautiful as I showed because, you know, it just looks good in 3D. So that's where the clay model is really nice to, um, to, 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 to teach you about the material. So what I've got here is stepping down garden, which, which would maximize the sunlight that would, you know, so you've got the same square footage area from the top, yeah? But now you're increasing the surface area so you can have a vertical garden and then a little aquaculture system at the bottom. Um, then I've designed a, 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 another home. So I'm starting to use a sandbag wall on the front. To, okay, starting to already look like an airship. Okay, because now you're seeing the typical airship greenhouse just out of polycarbonate because it's going to cost 50 times cheaper than building a wooden glass structure. So I thought, well, why can't we have a glass structure on the in the middle out of our geodesic? I still want love glass, but I don't want to have it everywhere. I want to have, remember my main aim is that people must be able to build a home um, without climbing into debt. That's my main, main, main aim. This is, this is what I'm put my life on to figure out. I want people to live debt free because I lost my own home in South Africa. I walked out of it. I walked out with $150,000 worth of all the permaculture systems. If I have time, I'll show you a little video, but I, I walked out of all of that just to stay free. Um, anyway, so there's the water tank. So you can see a little domes. There's a similar design Kirsten Dixon re recorded with this underground home. But, but what I want to show you is this, this sandbag wall is holding the burial. You remember, it's all buried at the back there, yeah? And that sandbag wall is holding the burial from falling forward. Um, I'll get back to the Brazil. Um, <clears throat> let's, uh, yeah, so here's a top view of that drawing. I'm making some changes. And here I'm still being a bit silly. I thought, oh, well, let's make a, a ferrous in shell on the left. Let's make, let's use tires on the right. Here's the earthship tubes to get the cold air in. There they are, if you can see my mouse, let's stick some rooms. Not really realizing that the back wall has to touch the mass the earth mass, like here, you can't have extra rooms behind because you need the sunlight to come in, warm up the tires, warm up this mass, and then you have the insulation for that. So I'm still being silly, I'd say. But, you know, there is the greenhouse and I'm thinking of thin pathways. There is the wetlands. Here is another bed. So what's not colored in is the, is the actual gardening bed. So, um, so yeah, so I'm developing little composts and just thinking of, what if we stick some pipes in the in that burial and have that? There is Jean Payne composter in the tires. They're top 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 left here. Um, so you know wood chips and um, hue manure or manure, and then that could you know have that heat traveling around. So this is what got me there. So here's some more designs. Just you guys can picture it. Um, and then I'm moving to something else. Uh, I'm, I'm moving to a whole. This is already 
um, I said this is a year ago, last winter. I've designed this this typical uh, starting to look like typical airship with tires. There's a reactor. So reactor is something that's made out of possibly acrete or some uh, uh, or hempcrete, uh, highly insulative bricks, and with a sauna in the middle made of mass. So uh, uh, so that's yeah. I'm I'm starting to make it simple with a two frequency geodesic dome, uh, some extra windows on the top to get in the sunlight. And of course, it's once again, it's going to be a roof here and it's all buried. And I'm using those cheap IBC tanks, those 250 gallon tanks. Obviously, all need to be connected in, in, in series. Uh, because I re as again, as once again, I'm, I'm afraid of those Earthship costs of $400,000. I'm like, well, how can we get it cheaper? So, so you started to see um, some of the methods. There's my biochar filter, and I'll hopefully get a chance to play a video for you. Um, and then, uh, then, then time to start so like an up drawing. Let's start building. So last summer, my, myself and my wife, you know, we decided, okay, let, let's let's do it. So I designed even a smaller home, under two hundred square feet, excluding the greenhouses. So I really wanted to meet America's building codes. So in fact, I want to stay under the building codes, so nobody has to ask questions. So this part, including the wall and the back rooms, are all under two hundred square feet. Um, which seems tiny, but will increase the space. Uh, I'll show you. I'll show you how some ideas. But here it is drawn on the ground. The bulldozer didn't come, so Zoe and I had to dig it all by hand, uh, which was really, uh, uh, you know, not dig, but remove the grass by hand. And and it, and it really, when you're building alone or with one other person, um, it takes long. In four months. I was able to literally get to almost what the top left picture is. I wasn't even be able to finish the foundation. So so it helped me a bit, but then you know I was building with this tool, um, you know, the bags myself, I was mixing the earth myself. It, it, it's very slow. Then we went to Brazil and there was opportunity with a client and he got lots of laborers. And um, you know, here's we'll build something more for warmer climate again. So water tank, a walk-in shower with a ferro cement shell roof a geodome with a vault. So like an airship for warmer climate, I'd say okay. still using, of course, the wetlands and, and, and so on. And here it is. This is how far we got to in three weeks. So I was going full power, had 11 laborers, uh, three workshop participants, and 6,000 feet of bag, two kilometers of bag. It, it was, it, it's something else. <laughs> um, and I had some challenges here, which I speak of in our drawing class and, and our watercolorum class. But yeah, major challenges. So we're drawing, um, you know, like for example, I, I decided to make the back of the vault was acrete. Here you can see those acrete bricks standing. So I made a, a roof out of ferro cement, and then the back of the that the curvature I decided to make out of bricks. And then I realized that this back dome was going to lean on the acrete. Now you, you can have acrete leaning onto the dome, sandbag dome, sandbag is very, very heavy. Acrete is almost like a sponge. So I had uh, basically a, a half of the dome leaning, not half, one third of the dome leaning onto acrete bricks, which would be a disaster, it would collapse. So that's why we raised the vault so high. You can see from the front, it's really, really, really high. It's almost like one, uh, four feet high. <laughs> you know, you, if you sit there, you don't, you know, like it's above your eyesight. So, you know, that's some of the challenges. But yeah, I had, I had an opportunity to play and get one of my sacred geometrical designs. You know, where the sacred geometry comes in is the vesica Pisces shape. So if you take two circles and you intercenter them on, on radius, um, you get this shape. And the beautiful thing about the shape is it's 1.618 from left to right, uh, bigger than front to back, which is quite cool, which is the same proportion as your finger. So I thought, well, if our bodies are designed to sacred geometry and every single sunflower and flower and every single thing in the universe, why can't our homes be designed to that? So, and here is something already working on. This is the, this is the next level. So then, so then I decided, okay, so let's put this reactor in. So there is the, there's those hempcrete bricks. Here's a sauna made out of sandbags. Um, and basically, uh, Eric, what, what, the main thing that I'm doing here is I've got three greenhouses. And again, this is already a previous design. The new design is so much simpler. So here you can see my African shell, those, the seashell was those uh, ferro cement ideas uh, that, I, that I've had. But basically, I've got this thick pipe here. Let's see if we can go from underneath. I've got here, I've got this thick pipe that, that sits in the geodesic dome. Okay. And um, I'm taking all the heat from, this, from the geodesic dome and I'm sending it 
basically to this blue barrel. There it is, 200 liter blue barrel, okay? And um, out of this blue barrel, it's like a distribution box. I have uh, pipes going underneath the wetlands in the greenhouses. I have some pipes going uh, inside the floor. Inside the floor, I'll show you the top view. There, there they are. Uh, inside the floor, I have some pipes to add heat and to tap heat in summer. Because it's, uh, uh, between um, April and May, I have sunlight hitting that room at an angle. So I, whilst my floor is getting hot, I want to take that heat and send it into the berm. So behind the tires is a typical Earthship berm, okay? Um, the insulation is not shown here, just for the intake cold pipes. There's two cold pipes here with pink. That's the insulation. The reason that insulation, for those that don't know, that's going to get really hot, the back berm. So I don't want the fresh cold air to warm up. Hence, it is insulated. Uh, from that hot uh, berm, yeah? So this berm is gonna heat up because I have a lot of pipes. It's basically going through at an angle and channeling all the heat from the greenhouses. So the main, main difference, Eric, is that the heat that the airships generate in their greenhouses, they dump all of it through this giant skylight, correct? We wanna take that heat and channel it into the berm. And not only that, I have a very clever design for underneath the sauna. I have three, uh, four foot uh, under sauna space, and I have a second manifold there. You can see right here, with this like red worm. And then I, uh, um, in a nutshell, I've got the hot air that's going through the berm. That's a really simplified diagram and heating up before the insulation, and that's the burial. Yeah. That's some gravel to make sure that the water goes around the house and doesn't go underneath, but that's uh, some mechanics. So I've got this reactor. This is a very simple sketch of the reactor. In the reactor, I thought of having some water because water has got an amazing way to store energy and to release energy. And then basically the, a little ferrous cement step. I might not do the whole water thing. I might just throw some plastic bottles in it, but that's a separate, but basically I have wood chips here. Wood chips and, uh, Manure or human manure. Human manure, you're wondering how the hell am I going to get human manure up here? A macerator pump. Uh, so I'll have a compost toilet backup should we ever like have electricity failure or something, because macerator pump obviously works with electricity. But basically, macerator pump sits behind the toilet and pulverizes your poo and wee in, with some water and sends it up to nine meters high, 18 feet high. So I'm going to have a couple of pipes here that will send this pulverized. Uh, urine was feces <laughs> in between the wood chips. And obviously uh, our human urine is full of nitrogen and wood chips can be replaced by the way with grass clippings or leaves. So, you know, wherever you live and wherever you have or cardboard even, but basically it's brown. Yeah, you, if you mix the two, you have a, you have a very fun, fun reaction starting of 70 degrees Celsius. It's close to a boiling point for six months. So that's really, really cool. And um, obviously by placing a few air pipes, um, sorry, by placing a few air pipes and uh, uh, maybe a couple of even water pipes, uh, uh, we're able to tap that heat off and send it to like an, a radiator battery, for example, inside our home or, uh, you know, or air pipes are much cheaper than water. You can just have you know, hot air going back into this floor cushion where I was during summertime tapping the heat off the floor. Now I can use the same pipes to send it back. Another feature that I've done here is these solar tubes, these two giant solar tubes. So sure, I kickstart the whole thing with a nice strong fan. Yes, that'll push all the air through this whole system. But then I have 18 feet tall um, solar tubes, basically a reflector on the back, like a torch. Uh, a polycarbonate on the front to create a greenhouse and a black pipe, 18 foot tall, one foot diameter, um, uh, you know, a huge pipe is going to get ridiculously hot and hot air rises. So, um, you know, this is this experiment that this is the, what I'm going to be building this year is to have this draft suction that will kickstart the whole thing with a fan. But then I want these things to then switch off the fan, disconnect it from this mat in, in the manifold. So I'll climb underneath the sauna, disconnect it because you know obviously a fan has its blade, so you don't want anything to obstruct you know airflow. Quick disconnection and then just have this two solar tubes pulling air until the end of the day, um, you know through the system. So you remember that the idea is passive. We want our homes to be passive. So should the microchips break? Should anything electronic collapse, 
I want this home to operate on the laws of physics. I'm just taking it one little, a couple of steps further than Mike Reynolds and very much inspired by, by whatever, all the research he's done. But, you know, as I said, unfortunately for our climate, we just got to make some alterations. So here's some, you know, sketches. Aragon was so complex to figure this airflow out. I had to go and rent a virtual reality session in St. Petersburg and spend six hours there just to draw the airflow. And I've got the, 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 the video on my um, <laughs> desktop. I'll, I'll, yes, I had to, because there is winter air, cold air to consider. That's because awesome. I need to, yeah, yeah, I needed to have cold, fresh air coming in. So I need to have that going. That's why I'm tapping into geothermal, because uh, I, the mm -hmm. ground underneath is six degrees Celsius, whilst outside is minus 20 Celsius, minus 30 Celsius. So, you know, the ground is much warmer. So yes, sure, I'll have some pipe, one, one pipe there. Then how I'm tricking the Canadian expensive heat exchange is basically the stale air that I'll be pulling. If you see here, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see well, but I have a stepping down greenhouse in a geodesic, like little steps. You remember I was showing on my clay model as well, those steps. So I've showered them now in here. So obviously the cold air sinks, correct? So if you pull, Let's see if we can pull the, the drawing of uh, uh, one of the previous drawings. So if you basically have caught there, there, that turquoise, the turquoise pipe here, um, let me show you another one. So th th there are the steps here, at bottom right, here's the steps. So there's that blue pipe right at the bottom. So I'm taking stale, uh, worked yeah, out uh, air that's- Okay, it caught up, sorry. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, so I'm taking this, this internet so these steps, yeah, yeah, so the steps allow for the, all the cold, stale air, cooler air to sink because cold air sinks, hot air rises, yeah? And uh, basically, I'll be pulling that cold air, stale, warmish, coolish air out and mixing it in, in the same trench, intertwining it with that in the geothermal trench that's going to be 60 feet long. So the cold air, fresh air that comes in will be preheated by the stale air that's going down, that's going out, that's not so cold. And that's obviously, you know, it's maybe, you know what I'm saying? So you've got one air preheat. So that's how I'm tricking the Canadian expensive, uh, I don't even know the fancy name for it. Um, and then of course I've got yeah, the- heat exchanger. The, yeah, of course I've got the, the, the skylight. I'm not being uh, stupid because if I'm gonna have overheating issues, but I'm not, uh, but I'm keeping it really simple. I'm gonna, uh, you have, paraffin uh, hydraulic things. I'm sure you've seen those. They use them in the greenhouses. So whilst I respect the whole huge skylight with rocks, I'm going to have a few of these as soon as the temperature reaches uh, 110 Fahrenheit or something like that, or, you know, so I don't have baking my plants. I don't know in Fahrenheit, but I can maybe speak in Celsius, 35, 40 Celsius. Okay. And all my air um, obviously gets to the geodesic because that's the highest point. My skylight opens. So I have a backup system so not to cook all the plants. My backup system doesn't need to have a person there. So that's so I'm designed. That's another key feature I'm doing. You can't leave a typical OSHA for an extended period of time. And I'm designing it in a way that I can travel. And for me to be able to travel and for a week, a month, I need to have a system that I can operate from my phone, for example, and that could open and close uh, you know, on temperature without sensors. The paraffin uh, hydraulic thing works without any sensors. As soon as the temperature hits uh, 40 degrees Celsius, the paraffin expands. It works totally on the laws of physics. No microchips. So <clears throat> yeah, so obviously there's been a lot of drawing. So this is where we're getting to right now. This is really bad drawing. This is just a quick sketch. We are busy right now drawing a, a mother. <laughs> I'll show it to you just now. A mother big um, you know, and a, a blueprint. I'm actually designing a full-on blueprint that I'll be able to sell in a couple of months. Um, and we're doing it with yeah. 30 other right. students. Uh, yeah, but basically, just, just to, I'll, and I'll explain it but just now, but in, the, in an essence, I've simplified it. I've got four volts, four volts that I use one form work, one form work and replicate and pour the roof with one mesh in and move it four times to create these four rooms. There's my center vault and here's my geodesic. And it worked so magically. That's beautiful, beauty about sacred geometry. When you start to use sacred geometry, you start to say, oh my God, this is a full ring. <laughs> and if I have a ring, I can have this geodesic supported. 
uh, here and I can have this geodesic supported here and my greenhouse comes off it. So I've got really cool features that are coming off. I've got my reactor in the back. So still the reactor is here, just th uh, three quarters of it. I've, I've got a little uh, acreage entrance on the left so I could have walk in, I'll have a cold entrance. So I don't have blow cold air into this thing in winter. I've got my two water tanks as per the airship and I have a tunnel that I can enter to take my compost out once it's spent at the end of six months uh, season. And obviously I'll be bringing the wood chips through the top, uh, basically driving a wheelbarrow on the berm of this airship hybrid. There, you can see the berm. You know, I'll probably make some uh, a gentler, uh, a gentler uh, ramp up, you know, that I can just drive my wheelbarrow and dump it off from the top. But these are like mechanics. Why am I doing the four replica vault? Because I fell in love when I went to Cal Earth they put this vault up the roof and uh, the, they put one mesh and, uh, and, uh, and, then, and, then, and then they just pour the whole roof in, in, in half a day. And then the room, room, two days later, they remove the formwork. This is all reusable. And then the, the shape stays by itself. I thought, oh my God, this is so much easier than sculpting a ferro cement roof because we've just done it in Brazil. It's five layers of mesh. It's two of these thick ones. Then it's a chicken wire on top. There is a chick diamond lath underneath. Then it's another size mesh. And then you have to have a plywood or something underneath so all your cement doesn't fall through. So you'd agree that this is, you know, sure, it'll cost you a bit of bucks. But if a, if you have a community invests into one of these forums, it will last for, I don't know, 500 rooms. <laughs> you know, so so this is why the new design is like revolutionary. Um uh, but where am I going with this is a totally organic shapes. I'm thinking an Earthship Foundation um, uh, it was tires. I'm thinking 3D printed walls, a concrete beam on top, and off the beam, I'm going to have a very, 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 very strong thin tile brickwork, which I'm going to study right uh, very soon this year. I've just contacted a wizard in Catalan Vault in Brazil, a wizard. And uh, I've actually got space for one more person. He can only take two students. And I'm going to go and learn from one of the best Catalan vaults. Just research Catalan vaults. So this is a software called Rhino Vault. Um, now, vaults are obviously much simpler. This is a very organic shape. So how they build it, they have a like a, a formwork. It could be a blob, balloon. It could be uh, whatever, you know, like a, a, a waffle thing uh, or rebar things that you follow the bricks. I'm gonna go another way. I'm putting augmented reality glasses on and in augmented reality, you can watch my video with Hajar Gebran that I did there on YouTube channel. And, and basically my augmented reality glasses are gonna show me where the next brick goes. And, uh, and you set the first layer with gypsum. It's a very fast setting mortar, very fast. And then basically with augmented reality, I'm seeing the shape. I don't need to build the formwork at all. This is where I'm going. But much research, I've got my virtual reality arriving in about a month. I've got a PC computer arriving next week. I'm buying a PC. I'm actually doing a Hackintosh with the iOS system. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> but strength through geometry is a concept I really want to bring up in this chat. The, 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 look at the roof on the right top. It's got no mortar. These blocks are all individually cut, brought from America to Barcelona set over formwork and then the formwork gets dropped and the whole thing went <laughs> and boom and it stayed that is strength with the geometry so i'm going to be designing structures that are bearable we're not moving away from earthship concept we're not moving away to thin roofs god forbid but we're moving to very very strong geometrical shells that can be buried by three feet of soil with insulation, of course, place. So I'm very much talking Earthship, but just a whole another level of Earthship because I want fast roofs. Where I'm going is maybe to collaborate with you or with maybe one other builder where we can create kits. So a container arrives to site, a 3D printer arrives. I'm gonna show you a 3D printer. You're gonna blow your, here we go, $110,000, 33 feet by 30 feet printing surface. May I say it again? $110,000 complete right now. I can order it tomorrow. Russian 3D printers, they are the pioneers, and I'm not trying to blow whistles on Russia, but it's, it's, it's truly simple technology 
and it's brilliant. This cat is brilliant printed. And why the picture on the right, that's the water tank that I was promising to show you that has appeared in a lot of my drawings. You can see how Super Adobe bags, if unplastered, um, are looking like little 3D printing lines, obviously a bit thicker, but so the possibilities are endless with printing technology coming down. So just to wrap up, where am I going with this? It's a combination of, a, of an airship with geothermal underground pipes, obviously a lot deeper than this. Uh, a dream catcher made of rope. Um, my teacher, John Todd, uh, which uh, creates a living eco machine. So I want to create living eco machines with aquaculture in the greenhouse of the airship. So these clear glass tanks, besides the typical uh, botanical cells, I want to have the clear glass tanks on the, uh, you know, that will allow uh, obviously sunlight to come through uh, into the room, but where I can place them, the, uh, wherever I can place them, so have quite a few of them for. Uh, additional water mass and of course for the look at the amazing plants that grow um i mean you've never seen one of these size lilies in an airship but if you add some the uh, he was able to treat radioactive waste with uh, with with nature with biology and the results are quite astonishing so it's so a research john todd and 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 he's got an amazing book which uh, I've, I've got so so just uh, ch check it out i'm trying to incorporate uh, rainbows uh, as strange as it sounds, so have certain prisms. I already spoke to the guy, Peter Erickstein. We have been in the conversation and he creates giant rainbows at the Solar Institute, by the way, in, uh, so in, in, in Oregon there. Um, yeah, and creating a little, uh, um, uh, like a calendar on top. So you can, through a lot of my designs, you saw this little onion bindu shape. So basically it's a, it's a 3D calendar that you sit inside, it's made of little pieces of glass that tell you when mercury retrogrades and when to plant potatoes. But I'm not gonna freak you guys out too much. And we're back at the slide with a very thick uh, thermal mass, much thicker than this, by the way. So we've got to design homes according to our climate. Um, you now it's one of my drawings, uh, uh, dream catchers. So, you know, I, I love these things. So imagine we can make 3D dream catchers that we can climb, that our plants can climb, our kids can climb, and we can climb, but made of rope. <laughs> and what I had to leave behind, uh, and I don't look back as this decor business I had for 16 years. This is where all of this uh, comes from. So here we go. Oh, so brief. I wish I could have seen more of your decor. That was that was great. I like that you ended on that with little Alosha inside his. Uh... What what was that? <laughs> uh, that was 16 years of work, and uh, this little piece has been like one of the only things I bought. Uh, um, here's another little. Laser cuts. Yeah, I, rem <clears throat> I remember seeing that on one of your videos. The, yeah, the laser cut one. Yeah, that one's yeah. nice. So uh, again, sacred geometry. It's all Fibonacci. There's a spiral. There's a spiral. Um, yeah. So here we are. Eric, I have some questions. Have yeah, go for it. <laughs> here, that's. It's actually two pages worth of questions here. So let's start back at the top. Um, All right, that's it for this video. I'm sure y'all have a lot of questions just like I do. And stay tuned for part two where I'm gonna be diving deep with Alosha into all the details. He's gonna break out the blueprints and answer all my questions.